Okay. So today we're going to start by talking about um, a couple more definitions that I want to continue over from the analysis section. Um, just because it will it'll spill over pretty well into today's lecture. Um, so let's see. I decided I'll include this. I'll, I'll include this in section five. So section five started last lecture with real analysis. And so today we're going to be talking about point step topology. And so obviously we haven't discussed what topology is. That's kind of for either the second half of today's lecture if um, we finish it quick enough or for next lecture. But essentially we kind of start talking about these sorts of ideas within the realm of real analysis, right? Because you know, we, a lot of things we discuss in real analysis have um, analogs of topology. And like, um, for those of you who know what topology is, a lot of stuff we do in real analysis, we do by generating a topology on the real numbers using that. So before that, there's a couple more things I want to cover from real analysis, and then we can jump into some of these new definitions, right, that you can kind of see in points of topology. So first of all, let's recall the definition of convergence, right? So all the sequence by Xn, right? And I'll use the same notation I used last time. Converges there exists an L, the rails. And then with this, right, for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a capital N in the natural numbers, which that's for all net, natural numbers bigger than, uh, oh, sorry, there should be a capital N, not the natural numbers. We have that xn minus l, et cetera, right? So I, I kind of just wrote this in one step here, as opposed to the last time where I can just wrote it with each quantified one line to make it easier to follow along the proof, but now that we're familiar with that, we can sort of write it in one line, right? Another reason I want to write it in one line is I want to compare this to a new definition that I'm about to write out, right? So is a definition, same thing, a sequence is what we call Cauchy. We essentially have almost the same um, part of the definition. However, we don't need a limit per se. Notice I'm just comparing terms of the sequence, right? So notice that these two things are almost the same. The only difference is here I'm comparing every single term to a limit, whereas here I'm just comparing the two things afterwards, right? And so here's a quick picture of this, right? So I mean, maybe I should not draw the negatives because we're not dealing with those. So if I have a sequence. Like this, right? We see from this that what this means is I'll draw an N, and after that N, everything falls within a certain value, right? Everything's within certain lines. Um, so that's for this definition. But for this definition, using Kochi, I'm no longer comparing this to some limit L, I'm just comparing the term to these sequences, right? So for example, Notice that this distance is getting smaller and smaller, right? So the distance between my terms um, should be within a certain range, but it's not just within successive terms, right? Here, this is for every mn, right? So this could include here to here, here to here. This could even include from here to here, right? And so you almost have the same idea of squeezing something in between two lines, right? And so because of that, you can probably see 
that if something is um, cushy, right, it definitely converges. Well, in the real numbers, and there's the problem, right? So we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, and I'll give you an example after this theorem. But so in real analysis, we talk about real numbers, right? And so it turns out that in the real numbers, these two are equivalent definitions. But I'm not going to write that out as a theorem as an if-and-else either. I'm going to write it out as I'll do it a really um, an immediate way. Convergent implies code. And so how do we get this? Well, think about it. We want to prove something that looks like this, right? But what we do know is that it converges. So for instance, what I can do is is a sketch of the proof. Right. Essentially, I'll set up everything, right? So I say sketch because I'm not going to write out a proof as an API and leave that to you as an exercise if you want to do it. But here, you have to say that f1 is very zero. Let's take it n. Maybe this is the same thing guaranteed by this guy, right? And so on and so forth. And maybe you would write out this definition if you have that, right? We, we write down things that we're given. So maybe we write down this and we use this value of n down here. But this is standard proof. This is a very standard technique in um, real analysis is adding an intelligent zero, adding zero in some way, because you know when you add zero, nothing changes. So we get something like this, right? We want to show that this is less than F1, right? But essentially, what I can do is this thing, I can add L and subtract L, right? And now, so I get something like this, right? I just rearrange my terms. And so now recall that we have a triangle and a form, right? We have that, something like this, Works right, and that's just the triangle inequality. So this negative goes away, right? So imagine this is my a and this is my b, which is negative, right? And so when it is negative here, I can fall the negative because we're taking the absolute value. And so there's two things we could have done here in the proof, right? I could have used this n. And let this be f form over two. So why am I just allowed to? So this still says this still says epsilon. Why am I allowed to maybe change this to f form over two? Well, in fact, I can change it to any constant times f form because the idea is f form is arbitrary, right? So when we bring things close and close to zero, I just want it to be small enough, and so I can multiply this by a constant. I can't multiply this by epsilon itself, right? Because then it depends on that term. But I can multiply this by a constant. So if I change this. To be C E, right, for some constant C, this definition still works, right? And most of the time we just let C be one, so there's just an F1, but sometimes we can, you know, kind of change this to be what we need to get an F1 at the end, right? So in this case, I have two things that I need to add up, so maybe I can make them both F1 over two, right? And if they're both F1 over two, then they add up to epsilon, so this. Excuse me, this guy from this definition, less than epsilon over two, and this guy over here is less than epsilon over two. There's our epsilon, which is right. A lot of mathematicians like doing it this way, right? You, you kind of have to work backwards, and you have to know which pieces you need to be able to see what epsilon, what constant you need here next to the epsilon. Um, another way to do it is that's equally correct, right? There's nothing wrong with this, right? These are both less than epsilon. And so there's two epsilon, 
That's perfectly fine, right? Because like I said, same same reason we had up here, I can put this constant here. Two is constant. So this works. Right? There's, there's nothing wrong with this proof. But most people prefer to end with just a nice epsilon. So they'll instead go back and change these guys to the epsilon over two to make it work, right? So that's just to show you kind of if you end up seeing proofs of some of these questions and some textbook or when you're looking at the material and you're wondering why you have epsilon over three or epsilon over twos, this is why, right? It, it's nothing but bookkeeping, right? Just to help you get a nice epsilon at the end. But it really doesn't matter. It, it's the same thing as long as it's off by a constant. Um, I know some of you might be asking, wait, why are these the same thing? Once an M and once an N, right? Well, here I'm taking any M and N greater than equal to capital N. But here, this is just an arbitrary variable, right? This is any, I could have replaced this with an M, right? And the it's still the same thing, nothing changes, right? So both of them are really applied from the same sequence, right? From something being convergent, right? So this shows you that if it's convergent, then it's Cauchy, right? And this is always true, no matter what space we're working, no matter what set we're working, it might not be real numbers, but this always works. So the obvious question, you know, I mean, the obvious thing is I'm about to tell you that Cauchy doesn't always imply convergence, right? Um, so here's the question. When is Cauchy sequence not convergent? And for those of you who are watching this on YouTube asynchronously, um, I invite you to pause the video and kind of think about this for a while because, again, it's good to kind of build these examples for yourself. Uh, once again, for those of you on Zoom and in person, sorry, not a great way to do this without just sitting here and being silent for a few minutes. But um, essentially, this doesn't work in the rails because in the rails, these are just equivalent definitions. But we can probably take subsets of the rails, right? So let, let's imagine this. This is a very common counterexample that's used. Um, so, okay, let x1 equals 0.1, x2 equals 1, 2, x3 equals to 1, 2, 3. And we'll keep going, right? Where xn is really. 0 0.1234567891 all the way to n. Right. If, if there's a 10 or an 11, you would include those. Right. So it's not just digits, you're just counting up the numbers. Well, um, I'm not going to write out an explicit formula for this because they get kind of nasty. You kind of have to start dealing with logarithms and like floors. Like you get you have to do stuff like the floor or ceiling of log base 10 of some number. And it, it gets very nasty because it's not just by place value, you have to insert multiple things, right? So X10 will be 0 0.12305678981, one, right? And the zero gets deleted, but then X11 would be 0 0.12345678981011, and then the numbering starts getting weird, right? So we're not gonna really deal with that. But here, there's a clear pattern, right? So this is a sequence. And it does, it is Cauchy, right? Because when I compare, any two terms after a certain point, it's within some place value because all the place values are the same up to the ones you start writing out later on, right? So, for example, if I look at xn plus one, there's an n plus one, whatever that number is up here, but up to there, it agrees here, right? And this is certainly less than 10 to the power of n, right? Even it's ways because once n is more than one digit, it's definitely even smaller than 10 to, 10 to the n, right? So if I pick any epsilon, right, I can figure out where the epsilon is in terms of magnitude, right? In terms of um, one over 10 to the power of something. And I'll take that to be my capital N. Everything afterwards, the biggest difference is between the first guy and all the guys after that but they'll differ by less than this amount, right? The difference will be less than that epsilon or that one over 10 to the end or something like that, right? So this is Cauchy. All 
right? And so in the real numbers, this is conversion, right? Because it does convert, it gets smaller and smaller, right? And maybe there's some limit, right? We don't know, we don't, we may be able to write out the limit, but we can think of what the limit is, right? Some number 0 0.1305679, 10, and it keeps going forever. But here's where it gets tricky. I said keeps going on forever. There is a pattern, but it's not a repeated pattern, right? So it's an irrational number. But what are all of these guys? They all stop somewhere. So they're all rational in some way, right? So if we consider this to be a sequence from the rationals, it's still Cauchy, right? That still holds, but it's not convergent anymore. It's not convergent in the rationals. Because when you talk about convergence in Cauchy, you have to be careful what, what space you're taking it from. Um, so the definition I gave you for conversion just implies real numbers, right? But if we take this to be just from a certain set, we require convergence to be convergent to a point that's still in the set, because if it's not a set, then we, you can think of it as not knowing what it is, right? So we start from something in the rational, then we've got something that's not rational, right? So there's the, there's the problem. So Cauchy doesn't always imply convergence. It depends on the state to work with. But what this does mean is that in the real numbers, these are the same. So just remember that conversion always implies Cauchy. It's based on the definition. And we prove it from nothing but the definition. But this is a good counter example to see that not all Cauchy sequences are convergent depending on the state. But in the real numbers, the sequence is Cauchy if and only if it's convergent. And this gives us the definition. I'm not going to use this definition later on, but it's something that's good to know. You see, space X is what we call complete. If every Cauchy sequence converges. In other words, for example, R, the real numbers, is a complete space, right? Because um, every Cauchy sequence does converge, right? Um, not all spaces have to be just numbers, and that's where the um, that's where topology comes in, right? You don't have to have numbers to have a space, you just be talking about a generic set. That's where topology comes in because we have to have a sense of distance if things aren't numbers, right? And so here, when I gave you the definition for conversion in Cauchy, I used this because we're used to this being the um, distance in the rails, right? But we might not always be working with that. This is these definitions only work for real numbers. Once we move out of the real numbers, even just R2, what are we talking about coordinate points, points in two-dimensional space? This definition no longer works, right? And so we need some way to talk about this. And that's where we start using points of topology. Right? So I'm gonna let's see. Well, keep these definitions in mind and refer back to them later. And once we are done with this next part, we'll go ahead and redefine these for any space. So again, keep in mind that these definitions I gave you were for the real numbers, right? But we don't just have, to, like we saw over there, you can consider this in any space. So we can talk about, okay, how can we reformulate these definitions to work in any space? And so, We run into what's called metric. So this first definition is a little bit hefty, but a lot of it should be intuitive. So we have something called metric. Right? Well, in English, um, the word metric is used for like measuring something, right? It, it's a metric for you have like the metric system, which is measurements, right? You would say that oh, this is a metric for evaluating a grade. You know, it's all it, it's a word meant to 
measure something. And that's exactly what we're going to use it for here. We're going to measure something, and typically it's distance, right? Well, let's say we don't know what distance is. Let's define it. So, metric is a function D mapping from, oh, I guess the metric. On a cells X. Right? Because you have the metrics with it. I have to know what where my objects are, right? So I'm gonna use R here, right? In other words, all right. Well, you guys know that this is kind of negative, right? That doesn't make sense to think about. So some people will write this as this, right? Which means that the distance can be zero or any all of them, but it can't be negative. Um, this is perfectly fine. You can include this as part of the definition. I'm not going to because it turns out you can prove that it's not negative from the, the, the other parts of the definition, right? So we'll leave it as x cross x to r. Remember that x cross x means I'm taking two things from the set. In other words, I measure a distance between two things. If you give me two things in the set, I will assign to it a number from r that represents the distance, right? This is what function is. Right. So a metric on a set X is a function with the following three points. Right. And so we have here eighteen points to the set. Um, I guess I should say that usually the function notation, right? I'll keep the I'll have parentheses and in the parentheses are my inputs, right? So technically my input is an ordered pair, which should technically be written like that, but this looks kind of stupid to write, right? So generally when we're dealing with functions that take multiple arguments, we'll just write them like this, right? Like for instance, if I'm talking about a function. In x and y, I would usually write something like this, but what I really mean is I'm taking a function and putting in a quarter pair, right? So generally we will ignore those um, parentheses just for convenience. We'll say that this distance to zero if and only if x equals y. In other words, two things can only have a distance of zero if they're at the exact same point, right? And that, that makes sense. Um, this next one, says that the distance is a symmetric function. Right, so this is called symmetry. Right, and this makes sense, right? When I take two things, it doesn't matter where I'm starting or ending, the distance will be the same. And finally, we have a triangle and quality because that's how we want to define distances. You want to make sure it follows some sort of equality, right? Which is the triangle. So, right, so the triangle is I'll take any three points, doesn't matter where they are in my space or my set. And I essentially have. Right, and notice that because these are anything, this is anything, I can swap these around however I want, right? So this is the triangle inequality. But why is the triangle inequality? Well, let's draw it out, right? So I'll take a point here, that's called x, point here, call y, point here, call z. It doesn't matter, right? The idea is that if I draw a line from x to z, right, if I want to travel to a different point, I have to go further than this distance, right? I mean, I, I have to go here. No matter how close you make it, even if you put it on the line, there's no way to go to um, X and Z without having a torque. But what is X and Z? That's just a straight up distance between X and Z, right? So you guys have probably heard the phrase, oh, the shortest distance between two points is a line. That's what this problem is, right? The shortest distance, and this one is inequality, no matter what distances I have, the shortest distance is just a straight, a straight line 
quote unquote, between X and Z. In other words, my method should represent some sort of distance that gives you a straight line, and that's going to be the sort of distance, right? Well, in terms of um, Euclidean geometry, like if we just work with absolute values and row numbers and stuff like that, this is the unique, there's a unique distance, right? If it's always this, there's no other path I can draw that has the same distance. But that doesn't mean it has to be unique by definition, because for instance, there's something called a taxi cab metric, right? So let's say I have a grid. Um, the reason it's called a taxi cab metric, or it's also called a Manhattan metric, is you know from New York, where all the streets are on the grid, right? And I'm going to define my distance by only moving on the north south and counting how many lines. If, if each of these is one block or one line, counting how many lines it takes to go from point to point. Right, so if I start here and, and say here, by the regular metric that we're used to, by the Euclidean metric, this is a straight line. And that's fine, right? There's no other distance I can go here, I can go here, and there's no way to do it faster, right? But what if I'm only allowed to travel on these, on, on the lines? Well, I can have this, right? I can also have something like this. And in both of these, notice that that's the same length, right? It's both the length of five. Two, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, right? In other words, if I restrict myself just to this section and just double back myself in any way, I have a lot of different ways I can create five, right? So all those paths have the same length according to that metric. So this illustrates two things. The first, that you can have multiple metrics on a set, right? That's why I said, you know, what's the term is set? I have to tell you what the metric is. I can't just assume there's a certain way to measure distance. There are various reasons why you might want to use different distances, right? So for instance, in machine learning, um, there are different cases where in two-dimensional case, you might use either the taxi cab metric or the regular Euclidean distance metric, right? And those both give different results that have meaning to it, right? So there are reasons that you would want to use different metrics for the same set. But what we have here, this is a this is the definition of what it means to be a metric, right? You need to follow these three properties. Now, I claim that you know from here that you know intuitively you know that this is always um, non-negative. But no way the definition that I say it's non-negative, right? So I can introduce this as a proposition, right? Um, and is there what any X, Y, and X, DX, Y, and Z, right? Well, let's look at it. Um, so, if you look at this, I can add these two together, and by the third property, by um, the triangle inequality, this has to be greater than equal to the start and the end points. Here's the start point, here's the end point, right? So this is by property two. Um, but then by property two, I can switch this around, right? I have a y and x here. Right? But wait, this is x and x. X is equal to x, right? By, by this definition of points, right? X is always equal to itself. Well, that means that this distance must be zero. But then here, I have two of the same thing, right? So this tells me two times the distance between x and y must be greater than zero. But then that means I can get rid of two, right? Now these are just row numbers, right? You know, all row numbers, so I can do this. And this is my problem one. And technically, the last thing is my problem zero. I'm using the property of the fact that these are row numbers, right? So there you have it, right? We, we can figure out that this is not negative just from all the problems we're given. I don't have to define that at this point, right? So what we have now is we have a way to talk about distances. And so 
is a set equipped with a metric. And when I say equipped, I just mean that whenever you're talking about a metric, you're talking about a specific one that we we'll have to find. So here's an example, right? Let x be the real numbers. Let d be this. This is a metric, right? In other words, this is how we define distances between real numbers, right? So how we prove that this is a metric, we go back and check this for everything here. Right, so this is an antinomial, so we have to check both directions, right? For any two numbers, um, if x is equal to y, right, then this is zero, and so f of is zero, zero. But then here, if I have that the absolute, if if this is equal to zero, right, then the absolute value of x minus y is equal to zero. But then you can remove the absolute values because zero, the absolute value is zero, zero, and then you move the y over, you get x equals y. Symmetry should be obvious, right? I can take out a negative. Right. But then what's what's the absolute value of negative one? That's just one, right? So these two are the same. So we get symmetry. And the triangle inequality is exactly the triangle inequality with the real triangle, right? For most of the spaces, it doesn't form a triangle. But this specific metric that we're used to on the real numbers is why we call it triangle inequality, right? And that's the first time you normally see something like this. So that's what metric spaces are, and we need to define a metric, right? So now that we have a formal definition of a metric, we can talk about things outside of the real numbers, right? So the sequence. Convergence, and here I'll say a sequence in X, right? Technically, I should be writing this just like I did for groups, right? Groups are equipped with the binary operator, so I write it as the order pair. But once you define what the metric space is, it's fine to refer to it by talking about the set itself, right? So here I, I implicitly mean that I'm talking about a sequence in X that has a metric. Right, this should be a metric space. So you talk about sequences in metric spaces. So the sequence in X converges if I use the L X right in the space such that. Right. So now, instead of writing out the absolute value, I'm putting this into um, the function, the metric function, right? So I just said the distance being less than f. And the distance function can be whatever, and you would use these properties to deal with that distance function, right? So if you want to formally start with just any space in general, this is how we would have to write. And similarly for coaching, right? Everything's the same except here. Um, I'll replace this with xn comma xn, right? And maybe I should say this is some sequence like this, x, right? So that's my that's my sequence. So that's how we would write this. Okay. So the important thing here is we need to establish that we have a distance function. So in real analysis, typically we we want to work with distances. When we start working with general topology, we can forget about distances. There's another way to talk about um, types of sets in, in general topology. But for now, we're going to stick with working with point set topology in our analysis. In other words, we're going to keep having this distance function. right? And so here, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of definitions at you. But we, we can also kind of draw them out to see what we mean. And we'll start with drawing it out in R, 
the real numbers, but then we can also look at it in other spaces, like maybe R2, the two-dimensional, the XY plane and stuff like that. Okay. So first, let's talk about the So a neighborhood, also known as an open ball, and we'll talk about one of these called balls in a little bit. So you take a neighborhood of a point. Oh, and I, I guess I should say for all of these definitions of a view view, assume that we already have a metric space at D where X is some set and D is a metric on that space, right? So assume we already have this, so that's what I'm going to do. So if we talk about a neighborhood of a point of X is for some fixed epsilon greater than zero, the set Denote as follows. This is how I personally denote it. There are other ways to do it. Um, there are three in a little bit. <laughs> um, I use the letter B for neighborhoods, um, but uh, a lot of people use B for all. That's also fine. Um, and I'll give you all the other things that I use in a little bit. But let's just define the set first. So this is all points from the space such as the distance between the point and this point is less than epsilon. So let's look at R, for instance. So let's pick a point X, right? And then there's some fixed epsilon, you know, give me some epsilon. What are the points where the distance between x and that point is less than epsilon, right? In other words, from here, I can go as far as x plus epsilon, and I can go as far to the left to x minus epsilon. Everything outside of this is a distance greater than epsilon away from x. But I want it strictly less than, right? So I can't include that point because the distance between these two points is exactly epsilon. So I want it. Right, that. And maybe that's where open comes from. Well, where does ball come from? It's really just when you work in dimensions higher than one, right, if I pick this as my point X, right? There's my epsilon, it's my radius of the circle, right? But if I want to go to three dimensions, right? Same thing, right? I can have a sphere around that point. And these are that's why they're called open ball. So you have the idea of a ball, a two-dimensional ball, which is circle, or an actual ball in three dimensions, right? But that includes all the points in here except for the boundary, right? We don't include the, the actual line we draw in a circle, but everything inside that we'll say is a neighborhood. So this is a formal definition of a neighborhood for an open ball. Um, other ways you'll see this is you might see the Right. Some people will use B, X, and colon epsilon. Some people might even use a comma here. There are some people who flip these two. Um, I don't like this notation because then it's sometimes hard to remember which goes where. Right. Technically, this would be the, the ball around X, the ball centered at X with distance epsilon. Right. That's so that's technically not why it's written this way, but I think this is much clearer, right? Is I give you a point X, this F point is an index, it's a fixed index telling you what the distance is, that's your neighborhood, right? So I, I like using this term better, but you will also see these, um, something like this as well in some books, right? So that's what, a, um, that's what it, the neighborhood is. Okay. So when we talk about topology, we're talking about what's called open set. 
And so far, I call this an open ball. I'm not telling you why it's called open, right? I haven't defined what it means to be open set, which is what I'll do in a little bit, but we need another definition for that. So let S be some subset of X. So S is a set, right? It's a subset of two states. An interior point of S is a point little x in S such that so or where there exists an F from the end zero. So remember there exists for the there only needs to be one. There could be multiple, but there only have to be one. There exists f from a to zero such that the f from ball of x is completely contained within s. Now, notice I have equality here, so it's allowed to, you know, it's allowed to be all of s if you want, but that's what it means to be an interior point. So let's look at an example. Let's look at the set. Zero to one. This is an interval. It goes in between zero to one, right? Well, I can take a point. Doesn't matter where. Here, what do epsilon balls look like in R? Well, the open. So here you also see epsilon ball, right? So you talk about the radius. So every neighborhood or open ball or epsilon ball, whatever you call it, in R, they're just intervals, right? They look exactly like intervals because for point X, it's X minus epsilon to X plus epsilon. So they just look like intervals. So here I can draw an interval like that. Or I can draw an interval like that. These are all neighborhoods of this point. Well, there exists some epsilon. I'll call this my epsilon, right? There is an epsilon such that this is inside here. So this is an interior point, right? But what if now I take this? Well, I can take one to be an element in my set, right? But no matter how I draw my neighborhoods, I always go outside of here because as soon as it takes, because epsilon is strictly greater than zero, right? So as soon as they one plus something, it goes beyond one, right? So one would not be an interior point. And obviously it's an interior point is one that's kind of inside the set in some way. This makes sense. You don't want it to be on the edge. You don't want it to be inside, right? And so that's kind of how we define open sets. So again, we'll take a subset S of the space. We say that X, S is an open set if for every X and S, X is an interior point. Of S. Right? So this is the formal definition of an open set. And so now we can ask ourselves, okay, for those things that we say are open in um, in R, like the open intervals, why why do we call them open? Well, let's look at this. If I pick a point in between zero and one, if I pick a point in this interval, right? So let's call this S. Here I need to prove that every point is an interior point. So just take an arbitrary, right? We were responding to this quantifier. We were responding to the universal quantifier. Let X be an S. Then by definition, zero is strictly less than X, strictly less than one, right? Um, there's generally, when you're dealing with stuff like this analysis, there's a trick you do where you take the, um, the point that's closest to, right? So say it's over here. Right. When I create my epsilon ball that I need to show, that I need to show as an interior point, use whichever is closest. Right. So what I'm going to say is let epsilon be, uh, let me write over here. So we're going to let epsilon be the minimum of x0 and x1. I could write these as absolute value of x minus zero and absolute value of x minus one, but I'm going to leave it as the distance function so you guys can see that we are working generally, right? I could have different 
metrics on R, right? You can divide by two. I don't need to divide by two, right? This is enough because technically that is still within the set, but generally we like to be super sure, right? Because I, I did say equality here, but if I draw something like this and draw something that intersects here, I'm much more likely, you know, if I compare these two, I almost have a sense in my head of, oh, this is definitely inside, whereas, well, this is technically inside, but I don't like saying it's inside, right? That's that's what this divided by two is for. I don't I don't want to touch the endpoints, right? But essentially, when I want to define it this way, what that means is my epsilon is this distance, right? Take whichever one's closer, cut it in two. So now my epsilon looks like this. And I've now done this for every single point in the set. Every single point is now an interior point, right? Why would zero to one not be open if it's this? Well, we just showed it, right? If I pick the point one, it's a point in the set, but it's not an interior point because it always goes past one, right? And we have a definition for that. Something's not open. We use well, okay. If something's not open in English, we usually say it's closed. Well, we have to be a bit careful about that definition here. So the set S is closed if its complement is open. So here's a big note. It could be both open and a set could be both open and closed or neither. We don't have this idea of oh, a set, if a set's open, then it's not closed or the vice versa. That's not true in general. Right? We'll just say that a set is closed if its complement is open. Right? So for example, right. Take x to be the rails. Let s be the rails. That's a subset, right? Every set is a subset of itself. Well, this is open because if I take any row number, obviously I can make any interval that's still real, right? So it's obviously open. What's its complement? It's the empty set, right? The empty set is trivially open because it doesn't have any points, right? Because here, look at the definition. It's open if for every point, this has to be true. Well, if there's no point, there's nothing to negate this. There's nothing to go against this definition. So the empty set is trivially open, right? But since it's open, that means its complement, R, is closed, right? So R is both open and closed. For the same reason, it, the empty set is both open and closed, right? So some people call these open sets for very obvious reasons, right? So for example, in the real numbers, the only open sets are the real numbers and the empty set, right? But if a set is open, obviously it complements all the open. Um, but this is how we define closed sets. Um, after a few definitions, I'll give you another characterization of a closed sets, right? But those aren't the definition, they're just equivalent definitions, right? Those, sorry, um, I worded that very bad. That's not the definition I'm giving you, but there are other characterizations of being closed that are equivalent to the definition of being closed, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So that when you say closed, you know, you don't always have to just say, oh, it's a complement open. Generally, that's the easiest way, but sometimes there might be an even easier way to check that something is closed. Okay, so so far we know what it means for sets to be open or closed. Now, to talk about close, we're going to start to talk about what's called limit points, right? So, let S be a subset of X. The limit point of S is a point X and S. Right, such that for all f1 greater than zero, the intersection 
of this S without the point X is not empty. So this looks kind of confusing, right? So write this down, but I can give you a better characterization of this, right? So um, for those of you who want to practice like reading reading math, think about what, what that means. Well, for whatever I just wrote, think about what it means. But now I'm going to give it give something else. Give I'll give you a more verbal definition, right? This neighborhood, right, contains at least one point in S that is not for itself. Right? So what that math jargon I just wrote down, that says the same thing as this. So the limit point must contain at least one point from the set that isn't that same point. Right? So if I have this set, right? Everything in here is a limit point, right? Because no matter what I pick in there, when I take any neighborhood, there's at least one point in between that, right? That isn't whatever I pick, right? What if I chose this? This is still a set, right? Is three a limit point? Well, the answer is no, because when I have an isolated, when I have a point like this, when I create an interval around it, it's good to only contain that point. So there is no point that is not x, right? So three in this case would not be a limit point. Um, we can also define a cluster or an accumulation point. So some people call it cluster points, some people call it accumulation points. S is X and S such that again, same definition, but very slight difference. This exception, right, contains infinitely many points. So the main difference between cluster or accumulation point and limit point is a limit point only requires one point, whereas an accumulation point or cluster point requires infinitely many points. But one thing I'll note is in the real numbers, our epsilon balls are neighborhoods. So, but our neighborhoods are intervals, which are infinitely many points in between them. So whenever there is at least one point, there are infinitely many. So in the real numbers, these are the same thing. These are exactly the same definition, the well, they're equivalent definitions. So in the real numbers, the limit point, plus the point, accumulation point, it's all the same thing. In fact, if you look on that Wikipedia, I think, they'll mention these are all synonymous, right? And so it kind of depends on what book you're using. So when you're looking at a paper or book, make sure you see how they define each of these, if they do use both terms. But if you want to talk formally or technically speaking, a limit point only cares about one point being in that neighborhood, whereas in a cluster of accumulation point, you find that you know, you're clustering or accumulating a whole bunch of stuff, you want infinitely many points, right? In, in that set. So that, that's the idea. Um, I almost used the word isolated point for this, but that technically is another definition. So an isolated point. So again, that S be a subset of X. An isolated point is a point, you wrote X and S, where 
there exists some epsilon such that the neighborhood now x is empty, right? In other words, the neighborhood only contains that point, right? So for example, in this case, when I, there exists some neighborhood, right? So let epsilon equals 2.5, then my neighborhood is, so if I let epsilon equals sorry, 0 0.5, then the epsilon 3 is 2.5 to 3.5, right? And so if this is my set F, this, oh, I should, um, I should do this, intersect S without S. Right. If I, you know, obviously the neighborhood will have a bunch of points, right? But if I'm looking at the intersection with the set, it only contains X, right? So I need this to talk about the points in the set. So that's what an isolated point is. And it makes sense, right? It's isolated from everything else. Um, let's see. Okay, so let S be a subset of X. Let capital L be the set of all limit points. So in other words, I'll go through capital S, I'll go through my set and find every single limit point, let that be a set, right? The closure of S, right? Been noted as S with a bar on top is let's see. Um, I'll write it this way. It's S union is limit points. In other words, if S isn't so. I should give, I'll give you another characterization of this, right? We'll see why this makes sense. Um, but essentially the closure is we want to almost close it up by including all the limit points where it gets to, right? So let me give you a couple more definitions before I draw a picture for this. Now that we know what limit points are, here's a proposition. The set S is closed if and only if S contains all of its limit points. And here's an exercise for you to prove this, right? And the easiest way to see this is the definition for limit point is almost the negation of the definition of openness, right? The, you know, I flip from a there exists to a for all, right? Still talking about that same neighborhood. So you can almost see that, you know, if closed means the complement is open, take a set, take its complement, you know, see that it's open and prove that S contains all those limit points, right? All the limit points can't be in the open sets that is in the complement. So this is another characterization of closed, uh, a set being closed, right? A set is closed if it contains all of its limit points. But what is this? I'm taking the set and unioning it with its limit points. In other words, what I'm doing with closure is if I have a set that's not closed, I'm gonna force it to be closed because if it contains all the limit points, then it's closed by definition, right? So here, this is the easiest way to make it closed, right? I'm not adding more points than I need. Is a proposition, is another proposition or maybe more of a note. That the closure of a set S is the intersection of all sets of all closed sets K such that S is right. So, in other words. Take every single closed set, 
that contains X, right? Take that intersection. That's the closure, right? So again, this is something you can prove by the definition, but people will say that the closure is the smallest closed set, right? That contains X. And the easiest way to define smallest is by taking the intersection. And the idea is you can take the intersection because um, all closed sets contain all the grid points. So as long as S is inside the closed set, right, I, I can, um, I'll make sure that that still will contain S, right? This closure will still contain S. So that's another way to talk about closure. So what is this talking about? Let's take a look at this set. Oh, yeah. I'll take the open circle. The open circle is an open set, right? If I take this point in the middle, right? Everything in the set is within some radius of that point. Um, but it's not closed because the limit points are all the points inside, but also all the points on here, right? Because if I take a point in the boundary and I put a ball around it, it contains infinitely many points in a circle, or it contains at least one point in the circle, right? So those are also limit points. So to include all the limit points, the closure is exactly the closed circle, right? I'm adding that. And so the it, it kind of means that you're adding all the edges, right? So not only do you want all the points inside, you also want the edges. Um, one common misconception here is that people think, oh, the limit points are the limit, they're the edges of it. That's not true. The insides are also limit points, right? I can look at this point. Well, it contains all points of that are inside. It's still, and you only need the one, right? It's still a limit point. But the point, the point of the word limit is to include um, the outsides. But we have a name for that. We call it the boundary, right? And that makes sense to the word because the boundary is exactly the thing that you would need to include. Um, So some notation. We usually use the letter E for an open set. Right? Um, and we usually say for a closed set. We this didn't um these come from German, I think. I don't know what E is, but K is, you know, K for closed is more of a German thing. Um, so you typically see this, well, I think F is more useful for close. K is what we use for what's called compact. Um, that's the different meaning there that we'll talk about maybe later. But here, people generally use E or U for open sets. Uh, both are fine. U is generally more a topological thing, where E is more of a E is more of an analytic thing. Obviously, it doesn't matter what letter you use, but there are conventions, right? Um, So if I write this as a circle, this is the set of all interior points of X, right? So the circle just means the interior. Well, we'll call it the interior, right? So sometimes you'll see it written like this, right? So definition, the boundary of a set S as a subset of X. This is usually denoted with a little delta, right? For those of you who've taken differential equations or similar to that, um, it's the same notation for partial derivatives. So this is the following set. It's a closure without the interior. So what does this mean? It means that if my set is neither open nor closed, if it's maybe a circle that's missing a bunch of things, right? First step is close it up. And then take away the insides. So all I'm left with is the edges, right? That's the boundary. 
and then the exterior of S is the complement of the closure, right? So you can, um, we can S, S, right? So just like the interior is in the middle, the exterior is everything on the outside, right? So the exterior, the interior, and the boundary are all disjoint, right? The interior is the inside, the boundary is whatever that. Middle part is the exterior is the outside, right? These are all disjoint sets. They have no intersection. But for every S, right, X can be written as a disjoint union of its interior, its boundary, and the exterior. Right. So these are some ways to look at some of these steps. And you can see that with these definitions, I, I kind of have this picture in my head of why these are called like interior, exterior, and stuff like that, right? There, there's some image as to why we use a lot of these definitions. Right. So these are some of the things you'll see in point set topology. Um, there's one more characterization I want to give you guys uh, for close. And so this is another characterization of close. So I'm not going to the proposition, I guess. Set is closed if every closing sequence in S converges to a point. Right. So you can almost see that you know the point to be closed, I have to have an infinite sequence that is closing that eventually gets to that point. Right. And it has to completely be in S. So something like this wouldn't be closed um, because I could construct a sequence that goes to three, but it doesn't completely stay in the S. Right. So that's another characterization of closed. So there's multiple characterizations of closed. The main definition is that it's complements over. But I can also check to see whether it contains all of its limit points, right? That also means the close, or I can also talk about you know this, right? And I'll talk about whether every Cauchy sequence um, converges to a point in S. Okay. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to cover in that uses point set topology that is a fairly big result in neural analysis. And here I'll use K, and from what I said earlier, you need to know what definition I'm about to give you. A set K is said to be compact if every open cover, and I'll define this in a little bit, of K is Finite subcover. So, what do these words mean? All right. So, let me define some of these words first. Let S be a subset of X. An open cover is a collection of sets. Right. So, an open cover S is a collection. Of sets and maybe we'll call them um, and these should be there should be a collection of open sets so I'll, I'll use ui actually I'll use u alpha and here I'll say alpha is capital A so the reason I use capital A is I'm just letting this be some indexing set because this could be finite, this could be infinite, it could be countably infinite, or it could be uncountably infinite. I don't know. 
Because when I use n in the naturals, I'm implying that it's countably infinite. But my open cover could be uncountably infinite. I could have uncountably many open covers, right? So when I use an indexing set, usually you'll define some indexing set A to just say alpha. So you can just say, oh, these are just some A. Right? I don't know what the cardinality of A is, but it works as an indexing set, right? So that's a common thing to do for arbitrary definitions like this, right? But the whole point is that when I take the union across all possible alphas of these open sets, this contains X, right? So I guess I could have written X is a subset of this guy, but this works as well, right? We have the backwards. Um, so in other words, if this, oh, I'm sorry, this should be an S, right? So if this is my set S, right? I can just have one set. That's a, that's a cover, right? That's an open cover. But I can also have something like this. Right, you just draw back the circle that goes past it, that's also an open cover. Right. Um, there's something we call the brute force cover, right? Just the you know, you can brute force the cover and always create one. Take every single point in the set and make a neighborhood. That's a cover, right? Because if, if it if I'm making a neighborhood for every single point, I'm obviously going to contain the set because it contains every neighborhood contains the point it's centered at, right? So obviously I am going to contain the whole set. Right, so that's kind of a stupid cover, but it is cover. But that's just what an open cover is, right? And then a subcover is nothing but a subset of this collection, right? So I'm not picking all of them. In fact, for finite subcover, it means I'm picking finitely many of them that um, that still cover, right? So for instance, let's say this is my S. Let's say I have infinitely many things out here that somehow cover it, right? So let's say there's infinitely many things out here, but then eventually it's only so many that actually cover S itself, right? So this is an open cover, but if there's finally many that cover S, it's a finite subcover. So if we look at the definition, it says that a set is compact if every open cover has a finite subcover, this means that it doesn't matter what open cover you take, it could be anything you want, right? Could be countably infinite, it could be uncountably infinite. You're taking every single possible open subcover, and you eventually want to show that it always has a finite subcover. Proving that can be kind of difficult, right? Because how do you provide every open set, right? Um, there is another characterization called sequentially compact. Um, I invite you to look up a definition for yourself. It's very similar to the definition of code, right? Um, a set is sequentially compact if every sequence in the set converges to a point in the set. Um, sorry. No, a set is, I believe the set is sequentially compact if every sequence in the set has a subsequence that converges to a point in the set, something like that. But the main thing is this definition of compact seems complicated. But if we have something like R, the real numbers, we get a very nice characterization, right? And this is one of the important theorems in real analysis. This is called the Heine Borel theorem. Right. So that A. Be a subset of some metric space X. Oh, sorry. Um, there's only one thing about that. So let A be an R. So the following statements are equivalent. So TFAE, or the following are equivalent, is three statements. Um, sometimes you'll see this written with just two things. K is compact. And K is closed and bounded. That's what it means to be compact in the real numbers. It's both closed and bounded. Um, these are the two important ones, right? 
there's technically a third. This K is sequentially compact. But this is all the equivalent to these, but generally the, this is the most important one, right? There, like is actually there is a third part of the equivalence, but the most important part of a Heine Borel is it gives you a characterization of compact sets in the real numbers, right? Um closing. And in fact, this works in R, right? It works in Euclidean spaces, but for now we're just gonna say real numbers, right? So a set is compact if and only if it is sort of closed and bounded. So you look at this set. This is closed. Why? Because what's its complement? Its complement is negative infinity three. That's an open set, right? So since its complement is open, this is closed. It contains all of its limit points. However, this is not compact, right? It's not enough. Well, closed is not enough to give you compactness. This is not compact because I can take an infinite subcover over here. Where I need an infinite number of things to cover up the infinity, right? I can never take a finite subcover set. I can never take finite many things, right? So, for example, if I take the open cover to be, you know, let um, A be exactly the same integral, right? Then U alpha, alpha to A. So, if I define U alpha to be equal to some epsilon. So that epsilon equals like one or something like that. Take this to be the one neighborhood or the epsilon neighborhood of alpha, right? In other words, take every single point in here and make an epsilon ball around it, the stupid cover we talked about earlier. This is an open cover, right? It obviously contains all of this. But you're never going to be able to find the finite subcover of this. Because if I want to cover everything up to infinity, I have to take infinitely many things, right? I cannot, anytime I have something, I have a finite number of these guys, I stop somewhere. And it's going to be something, whatever the biggest one is, since there's a finite number of them, each of them have an alpha, right? Take the maximum of all of them and take alpha plus two. That's not being covered, right? So this, this is not compact because it's not bounded. If it's bounded, then we're fine, right? If it's something like three to four, this is both closed and bounded. So this is compact. And so it looks like we talk, we're talking a lot about intervals here, right? Um, another proposition to know is that every open set in R can be written as a countable disjoint union of open intervals, right? So it, in R, it makes more sense to think about intervals than sets. So I claim that every open set can be written as just a whole bunch of open intervals stitched together, right? And so sometimes when you're computing stuff like this, this might be very helpful, right? Instead of talking about set, we just talk about intervals, which is much, much easier to talk about um, properties of intervals, right? So this is about all I wanted to cover in terms of point set topology in the row numbers and or metric spaces. You, know, you will see a lot of this in a typical row analysis course. Um, and it kind of mixes a little bit of analysis topology, but a lot of this is fairly important, right? You, you need to know this stuff to be able to work. With. You, you want to be able to work with compactness, right? And so you want this kind of equivalence between closed and bounded and compact, right? A lot of important theorems in further analysis when you get into research level stuff deals with compactness instead of closure, right? Compactness tends to be a very important topic. So I think that's a good stopping point um, that ends section five. Um, I haven't decided yet how much topology I want to present, but the next lecture we have on Friday will be a um, introduction to topology. Um, depending on how far we get, I might also do category theory. Uh, for now, um, Friday will be the last official lecture because I will be out of town the week after that. and. 
at maximum, we'll have maybe one or two more topics I want to cover. So I think for now, a good stopping point will be um, this Friday. But if there's any other things you guys want me to lecture on, I'm more than happy to record a video and post it, right? So um, let me know if there's anything you guys want to see or if there's any other topics you guys want to know about. Um, I'll send out an email or something like that. And if there's more, um, if there if there's a lot of um, desire for it, I'll you know, put up new videos on that topic. But if there's just something um, maybe one or two of you want to look at, we can look at that um, individually. Right. Okay, so I will see you guys on Friday.